Coming up on the Branding Deep Dive podcast. And by the way, we're not going to send that mailer to anybody. We're going to only send that mailer to specific people targeting. Mm. We don't just flood the entire household. No, we only aim for those customers that have cars between a certain years that we all the data, demographics again. We're only going to shoot for those houses that make a certain amount of income. All these things, right? So we target that and then we target you know, there are zip codes, there are sub-zip codes, and then there are carrier routes. Carrier routes. You know the mail, mail the mailbox man that goes through the routes? Mm-hmm. Down to that. So I can literally hit the, in, out of the entire canton, I, I can only, I can literally just choose Chima Street and only hit his street and that's it. This is Ahmed Chima and welcome to the Branding Deep Dive podcast. If you're new here, this is a podcast where we have in-depth discussions about what brands are doing well to drive customer loyalty and how you can take those principles and apply them in your own brand. This episode that you're listening to right now is part two of a discussion we had with Zar Sayed about Branding Mechanic One. If you haven't listened to part one, make sure you stop right now and go listen to that. In part two, Zar gets into the nitty gritty of his approach to auto repair advertising, and dealing with negative reviews. If you're a small business owner, grab a notebook because there is a lot to learn in this episode. Now, here's Zar Sayed. One thing I will add though, one thing I will add, when my, when this friend of mine, Andy, opened up the shop, I'm not gonna lie, for the first time in being in business, I actually now have a competitor who's offering the same warranty as I am, wants to work on the same cars. If you look at his shop, it's called the Detroit Garage. He has amazing aesthetics, beautiful shops. He had literally, again, I, I was doing it in 2014, so was he. He did it in one shop, but he grew it to six shops. And, and he's a great guy. And he learned it from his dad. You know, his dad also uh, runs a big shop. And the story with that is that Andy was promised that when he reaches a certain age, he's going to inherit his dad's behemoth of a shop which is called Curtis Auto Service. It's incredible. It's huge in Allen Park. But something must have happened and he's like, you know what, I'm not going to receive this shop or whatever happened. And he decided to go open up his own, you know, and he killed it. He's killing it. So I got into pretty, not intimidated, but I got worried. I'm like, dude, this guy's right down the street from me, man. Like I'm going to have to... Growth now is necessary upon me. I've been too much in my comfort zone. And now guess what? The growth has knocked on my door and now I'm going to have to grow without a choice. And I like that. Challenge when the going get that's another thing about sorry for being so abstract. As a business owner, when the going gets tough, the, the tough get going. You have to constantly mm-hmm. arise to the challenge. You always have to realize that you are bigger than your circumstances. Always, even if you're not, fake it until you make it, man. But 100 out of 100 times, be bigger than your circumstances. I call up my brother, I tell him, and he opened up a shop. Oh my god. I'm going to accept my game. And my brother's like, dude, relax. I'm like, dude, why are you so lax about this? He's like, you don't understand. He can never beat you. I'm like, thanks for blowing smoke up my butt, but give me the logistics behind this because I'm a very analytical person. <laughs> I'm not buying anything. <laughs> yes, he's like, Zar, mechanic one is you. Quote unquote, he's Zar, mechanic one is you and you are mechanic one. You That's one shop and you're 110% on top of it. There's no way in heck he can match that kind of quality. He can't. He's got six locations to worry. He's going to hire a service writer or a manager. And you what? Do you think a service writer or manager is going to be better? Or is he going to care that much as much as you care? And do you think he's that invested into his business as you are? So at the end of the day, that whole like, oh, owner shouldn't be at the counter. Owner should be at the front lines. No, I disagree. Owner should always be at the front lines. I want to be glad you're here to and how literally that guy, the general, right, Marcus Aurelius, why does his army respect him so much? Because he's the general and he should be sitting on his high horse, but he's not. He's literally on the front lines. He's the first one to engage in battle, get blood on his sword, right? So in order for your men, to, your team to respect you, in order to, you know, be the best at what you do, you have to be on the front line, you know? Now, sure, you can take time off as a owner and you have you don't have to be in the business because you have a manager and you have an assistant manager and you have the whole team set up. But just know, nobody will run your business as good as you will. Nobody. No matter even if you partner them up, no matter if you give them, you know, 
profit sharing, even if you give them equity, at the end of the day, it is your business and nobody is going to run it better than you are. And that's where your trump card of customer service comes in. Because I'm willing to yes. ask the business. You know what I mean? I don't know if that service, the other service writer manager is willing to do that for his. And I mean, this is a little bit more extreme current. But I'm just saying what I mean is I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Is he? That's, that's man, you're just dropping gems on gems on gems. So to summarize for our audience, one, the main thing we're talking about right now, customer experience or customer service and there's two parts to that if i can summarize what zara is saying one is the service part which everyone understands what that is you have to be able to give what the customer wants in a way that benefits both the company and the customer but the other part zara is saying is the customer part and that's so interesting especially because when you have like an in-person business zara man this is crazy you not only have a target audience for your business you have a target customer service person you said you have 10 different personalities that you've created in your head that you apply different you know methods of customer service to in order to get that best experience back so you are you're taking this target audience um idea when you're starting a business and applying it to the customer service side where you're saying okay now customer service is a big thing i need to understand the target audience of my customer service in order to best serve you know best provide that service uh and that if that means you know developing 10 different customers that are asking for service, um, then be it. And then you create these things. I think that's such an amazing point for our listeners. Yeah, Abdulna, just to touch on that a little bit. We, we've talked in the past, I think, I don't know if we, on the podcast, but I know me and you have talked about personalizing your products and services for your audience or for your customer and how that really creates a unique customer experience. And what Zara is doing, you would think you could only do that in the product space. Right. But Zara is proving that, like, look, customer service can also be personalized for each person individually. And so the, the, uh, point. the biggest idea that I came up with, honestly, and this is what I use, I, I've learned to use this as my as my my training manual. So we have operations manual, which which is a handbook that tells you how to do day to day things when you're training people. Then we have management handbook which is literally what tells you the whole management of the shop and as if you're hiring a manager and whatnot. So in the management handbook, we call this the uh, one of the modules that's right there, um, is an example of customer service. Um, you guys know Itihad Airways, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know you guys have flown here too. So Itihad Airways, um, you know, they're known for having one of the nicest first class cabins, right? Uh, I was luckily fortunate enough to witness, witness this a couple of years ago myself, and I'm not gonna lie, it's it's incredible. <laughs> it's not only to get your own cabin and all that stuff, but to take it one level up. Etihad came up with another level that is better than so. There's economy, business, first class, diamond class, right? And diamond class is, was their own like nobody's in their market. After, after diamond class, you have your own private jet, pretty much, right? Because, like I'm saying, every every airline would have a economy, business, and first. But who, who the heck has one tier above that? Very few. Maybe Emirates or whatever, they came out later. But guess what? You know, it was like, they're kind of like Bugatti. They're like, hey, man, you know what? Let's make better, even better. You know, since we're already so ahead, make better, even better. So they came up with the Etihad residence. And what is the Etihad residence? I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Etihad residence. You live, you live in the plane. Well, close, close. <laughs> Instead of them giving you a cabin, they literally give you a section of the plane, which is your own studio apartment. It's for twenty thousand dollars. All right, and and the Etihad residence. You're probably thinking, okay, it's not like a private jet experience, but you're on a regular plane. You're an Airbus or a Boeing, you know. And the front, right behind the cabin, the pilot. That the little block of you is all yours. You can walk around in it. You can have your own bathroom. You can have whatever, right? And by the way, the twenty thousand dollars that you're paying, you're not paying for that space. That's what a lot of people. And I watched just you guys you YouTube this. There are people vlogging about this, going physically doing it, buying the ticket, vlogging the whole experience. One, and I've watched about nine, ten different videos on that before I included it into our training module. It had airways and the residence suite. Uh, is not about the space on the plane that you're paying twenty thousand dollars for. It's all about the service. Now, what do I do now? Here's the thing. What do I mean by the service? The whole experience starts from the day your flight is. A Maybach, a Mercedes Maybach, would come pick you up from your home. All right, 
That's how the experience starts. Like, check this out. Talk about service, right? That same driver is going to be your butler throughout the entire journey. He's going to be on the plane with you as your butler, like Alfred and Bruce Lee. <laughs> he literally, I'm telling you, it's incredible. Talk about, yeah. the, t- talk about the pinnacle of customer service, right? It literally <laughs> knocks on your door, door holds your house door open, holds your driver, in, you know, your back, your car door open, gets you in, takes you to a special hidden terminal in the airport, which is only for Ittihad residents, you know, flyers. Wow. And you're the only person in that entire lobby where you have your own buffet, only for one person. That's crazy. You only and you, you have your entire space is given to you for you waiting. And that you have showers there, you have jacuzzi there. It's like your own little luxury house in the airport. <laughs> That's part of the entire experience. And then guess what? That same butler is the entire time. Your driver, the butler, he's the one, the only person you're having contact with. Nobody else. There's no different people. He's coming to you. You get to know him by name before you buy the ticket. He does all the research about you. I know this gets creepy. He does all the research about you, okay? He finds out what Chima likes, what he doesn't like, what kind of food he likes. He'll find a picture that you like, of your own personal picture of you and your brother, or whatever, and you'll put that picture in your in your Etihad residence apartment suite on the plane. He <laughs> wants to make this experience extremely hand catered and personalized just to you. So he's already done all your homework on you from a week before. And now he's just giving you exactly what you want. And he's coming up to you and he's telling you some caviar or, or whatever food that you like. The best version of it. That's okay. the only thing you can get. If he knows coffee and he likes, he knows that Chima likes dark roast coffee, he's going to find the best dark roast coffee in the world. He'll probably have a ship from Malaysia or something. Just so Chima can have this coffee. Because everything on the residence has to be Chima's best experience. It has to be the best steak that he's ever had. It has to be the best coffee. It has to be the best car ride. It has to be the best butler. It has to be the best concierge. Everything. And then that same butler, you and him, you, he literally escorts you to the plane. You're the first person to get on the plane. And you're not, you don't use the gate because obviously those are for peasants, right? <laughs> you literally, you literally, he sits you in this little golf cart like looking thing and, and you literally get on the runway as like, like as if it's a private jet and you get on there and an the entire cruise flight crew, they know that we have a residence member on board this, for this flight. <laughs> so in, the pilots will come out and all the flight attendants will come out and they will literally salute you as you enter the plane. <laughs> all right? <laughs> you see what I mean? And then once you yeah. get on the plane, you literally have literally every single food and there's like supper and 11 Z and lunch and everything in between and tea time and all the stuff, right? They're just pampering you. For that entire 17 hours or 18 hour flight that you're having, they're, all they're doing to you, they're not even taking care of you, they're not servicing you, they're pampering you like a baby. That's the kind of service it is, right? So the point that you're just amazed, you're like, dude, this, this place is like, of course I'm sitting in Armani furniture here and this and that and blah, 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 but dude, the service was just so out of my mind that I forgot about the rest of the stuff. Mm-hmm. Imagine providing that kind of service. So anytime I hire a manager or train a someone customer service, I make them watch the vlogs on Etihad Resident. And I'm like, our goal, sure, we might not be the Etihad Residents, I get it, but this is what we're shooting for. That individual mm-hmm. experience, that VIP experience, because these guys, they were servicing, they may very well be able to afford Etihad Residents. And if they're doing it in, in, the, in the airline industry, why can't we do it in the automotive repair industry? We have less competition. Mm. They have Emirates, that's a, that's they have Turkish Airlines, they have all the other airlines. We're just mechanic one and what? Affordable automotive clinic or Bell Tire? Like, bro. That, that's such an important point I want to highlight again. So you said, you know, our, cust- our customers, our target audience have a certain expectation of customer service. You know, we got to match that in our, in our space. So for them, if they're flying at the Etihad residents, they better be in automotive residence um, at our service because otherwise it's, 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 you know, they're not getting what they want and you're not actually, you know, you're, you're, there's a, there would be a discrepancy between your target audience and the service that you actually provide. That's a very important point. You don't want that discrep- discrepancy. Furthermore, I'll add one more thing to this too. Um, right now, I don't know if you guys have noticed this as well, but 
right now we are in a, in a condition of economy and we're in times where people are willing to spend. Has money been an issue recently, especially in America, especially where we are? PS5 comes out, it's sold out. People are yeah. buying, Louis Vuitton is literally blowing stuff off their shelves. Gucci is blowing that stuff. I get stimulus checks and all that stuff, I get that. People yeah. are dropping money on Dogecoin. People, people literally... I was yeah. like, where? People are... You're, ta- you're asking for stimulus checks and then you're dropping right? money on... Exactly, like, right? Where is this money? And we won't get into the whole political aspect of it, right? But the main thing I'm saying is, right now, we are in a, in a time of the, of the human era and life, right? That people are willing to pay but there are not good enough services out there. For example, mm. in Canton, I'll tell you this right now. And I've said this to a lot of other investors as well. If you open up an amazing steakhouse in Canton, right? The most expensive. You'll be booked every single weekend. I'll use so many examples. What's the nicest restaurant, money-wise, as far as the most expensive restaurant in Canton? From my experience, is LA Bistro. On right here, Cherry Hill, right? When you go, you're easy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's amazing gourmet food, right? The, oh, I, know, I personally know the owner from Dearborn who was location in, you know, in uh, West Dearborn. He brought it to Canton. And before he opened up to Canton, he was talking to me about that too. He said, um, you know, so you really think Canton is going to go well? And I'm like, me, my family, all these other people that I know come to LB Bistro from Canton on a regular basis. Try it, hundred percent. I think that's gonna be a go. And I'm not, I'm not like, I'm, I'm, I'm not a motive man. I don't have to just like whatever. But the thing is, look at the patterns, right? So LA Bistro, anytime you go there, especially now that things are opened up, it's always packed. So my point is, it's almost like people are finding excuses and reasons to spend, but there isn't anywhere to spend. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If you open up a a, a steakhouse like Min 29 in West Dearborn, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I'm, I'm a vegetarian, by the way, I know this, so shame on you guys. <laughs> but anyways, just kidding. He, 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 he's in West Virginia. Um, this Prime 29, <laughs> there's Min 29, right? These are halal steakhouses, right? That are really, really up there, and they're expensive. They charge. And guess what? People pay, and they're booked, right? So people don't have, My point that I'm trying to make is no matter what your business idea is, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's an auto shop, whatever, don't settle for the cheap, settle for the high, because guess what? People are, they will pay, they will pay, as long as what? You have to be the best. Be the best, charge whatever price you want, but be the best, right? And you know, that's that's just another part of being in business too, is that don't go into a business if you're not 110% in. I, I get that whole idea of, Love what you do and, and you'll never work a day in your life. I get that too, but I also at the same time think that's too liberal and that's too, uh, what's the word? That's, that's too like first world. Like it's coming from a very first world like privileged. place, privileged. It's coming from a very privileged space when you say, oh, I, should, I should only do what I love. <laughs> I, when you ask me, do I love what I do? Yeah, but do I love it? Like, oh my God, I love it. No. Why did, I, why did I go into auto repair? Because I was 21, 22 years old, and I'm like, there's no other thing, there's no other trade. As a 21 year old, as a 22 year old, there's no other trade that I that's out there that I have six, seven years worth of experience in. If I go into anything else, if I drop this and start something else, it's gonna be, I'm gonna have to start from scratch. So mm-hmm. I have to be smart. See, that's what I'm saying. Use, use, be logical, use your brain, be smart about things. Be like, okay. I'm really good at doing this, but at the same time, I'm not crazy about it. So where's that fine medium? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I realized that, okay, automotive repair, I know I've learned a lot about I have a head start at it. I, I, I know quite a bit about it. Let me, let me capitalize on this compared to, oh, honestly, between, between just us three, and I think anybody knows this about me, I want to become an architect. I mm-hmm. love everything about architecture. Hold on, I love, 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 love everything about architecture. That, that's, that, that's where my true passion, I feel like. It well, is. Hold on. This, Am I this, this podcast. No. I'm this, not podcast <laughs> this podcast went from branding deep dive to career advice. <laughs> <laughs> not just that. He's like, just between us three, I want to be an architect. Dude, we're, we're recording this. And like, well, <laughs> now everyone knows, right? right? This, is a spe- this, is, this is a special that I dropped right here. So now everyone yeah. knows. But that's the thing. My, my passion is for architecture, you know, but I, what do I know about architecture? Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Absolutely <laughs> nothing, right? Now, am I, do I, am I crazy in love with automotive? Yes, I like cars, but am I crazy in love with auto repair? Not really. 
I'm content about it. But am I good at it? And do I keep improving at it? Yeah. Does it work out good? It does, you know. And running this back to what your company is good at, I looked on your website and noticed a couple of things. I don't know how many auto, um, aftermarket service uh, shops do this, but you guys provide what's called vehicle education workshops. Is that unique to you guys? Or have you seen it? Where did you learn that from? I, in, in all the shops that I, I've met over 400 plus shop owners, um, never came across anybody that has an idea. And I'll be honest with yeah. you, only in the five, six years that we've been open now, only, I've been only taken up on this offer twice. You know, it's always there. Mm-hmm. If anybody registers, if nobody else shows up, it'll just be kind of awkward. It'll just be me and we're uh, do registering. Like, oh, this the class? I'm like, yep, just me and you, buddy. <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> Let's talk. What do you want to know? <laughs> Why am I here on a Sunday? If this better, better, better yeah. be recorded, right? I'm willing to do it, man. But the thing okay. is that um, I've only been taken up on this offer twice. The first was uh, through the masjid, uh, MCWS. You know, they basically uh, organized for the youth to come. And uh, we had like 15, 20 people come and it's all recorded on our Instagram live and everything. We still have the video of it. And it was just about basic maintenance of how to maintain mm-hmm. a car, change your oil, um, you know, what to do in hazardous situations. Like the basic, basic, super duper basic knowledge that I think everyone should have. It was, like a th- it was supposed to be like a 15 minute thing. It became like an hour thing because everybody had questions. We had snacks, water, whatever, cookies. And it was a fun thing, right? Um, and so some friends showed up too, just to see how it went down. That was the first one. The second one, you know, uh, this was really cute. Um, this group of old ladies in Plymouth decided to go ahead and sign up for it as a group, right? Uh, <laughs> this was hilarious, man. Um, they literally signed up because um, they literally bought a bunch of new cars, like BB Mars and stuff, whatever, and they didn't know how to do anything on the car. Anything. They couldn't even know how to turn on the radio. Like I said, these are like 70 whatever. Their husbands have passed away. Their kids are like too busy for them, right? So literally, we're bringing in these brand new Beamers and these brand new Benzes, whatever. Brand new, like 100, 200 miles on them, right? And we're just literally getting inside each and every single car with them and telling them, this is the iDrive. This is the BMW interface. This is how you use it, okay? This is the Mercedes <laughs> car. Right? This is how you use it. One lady didn't even know how to start her car. I was like... I'm like, was it push to start? It was push to start, yeah. You know, and I'm like, I'm like this. I'm like, and I told her, she was like, literally, she brought us stuff. And we, we have Christmas time comes around, holiday time, and we have customers that bring us gifts, right? Did that lady for the next like two weeks bought us like lunch every Saturday because she, <laughs> and I told her that your key. Imagine the dealership that sold them this car, they could have told her this. Mm. The, the point is, every single that is a common pattern that every customer I hear from. Zar, thank you for taking the time to actually explain it to me. Mm. You don't have to do that. Thank you for going above and beyond and going and letting me know. Because everybody's like, oh, here's the key. Here's a car. I'm riding a Beamer. Next, you know. So this lady, I was like, not only do you not have to put the key fob in to start, guess what? You put this key fob in your pocket. You walk away. You touch your door handle. It locks by itself. And she, was, and she looked at me like I was like telling her some like, stuff on black magic. And, I, and I'm like, by the way, another thing. The car unlocked itself and the keys in your purse and you come within close radius of the car, the car automatically unlocked itself. And she was like, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, it's true. Do you want me to do it? And she was like, no, no, it's not going to do that. They're, they're, they're so mid and this and that. Like, <laughs> I literally locked the car. I literally did, got out of the car, put the key in my pocket, tapped the handle and locked, walked away, walked back in, the car's unlocked. And she was like, <laughs> and you know, th- no. that went on. She was just like, holy crap, like, like who knew, right? But she called yeah. us, you know, before they registered, they called and they were like, you know, yeah. um, this and that and blah, blah, blah. We have these new cars, whatever. And, um, you know, like, we, what's any, we, they, they said we were willing to pay. This is what really broke my heart. They literally said we are willing to pay so, uh, someone 100 bucks, 200 bucks, whatever, just to teach us some basic functions in our car. And I was like, wow. man, like, come on, like, this lady, come on, like, this <laughs> old, little old, cute, and adorable lady. And she's coming with a bunch of her friends, and I'm not gonna charge this lady to show her how to freaking work her Kia, work her radio. But that's not, <laughs> and like, I get more joy out of it by sitting in a brand new car and checking it out, you know? So yeah. <clears throat> she and she wanted, she literally were like forcing us to pay, and I'm like, just do it, it's fine. Like, this is called giving back, you know? Nobody yeah. takes, up, so takes us up on it. Thank you for taking us up on it. And she was just became the raging fan, you know? Unfortunately, yeah. you know, she, I don't know if she's gonna live that long to tell a lot of people. In, <laughs> in, in the same vein, another thing I noticed on your website, it says that you uniquely do is that you are what's called female friendly. I hope you have a good story about this. 
walk us through that uh, you know unique uh, quality of your company. <laughs> so female friendly is an actual. There's a there's there, a lot of what you have to get certifications for everything. It's a very heavily regular regulated industry. Um, as it should be, by the way. As it should be, right? As it should be. Uh, I love the checks and balances system, by the way. Anytime any customers have reported us to the state of Michigan, uh, I'll be honest, I'm very transparent. I have been to been to the state of Michigan, to Lansing, when they've called me to do an audit, things like that. And I sit down with them and I tell them straight up, I'm like, guys, I'm so glad you exist because if you guys didn't exist, how would we improve? That's literally how I start my conversation. They look at me like, you know, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I most people or whatever, you know, but, uh, but this guy came here to learn and I'm like, 100%. I want you guys to point out all the holes in my shop. Because the first thing I'm going to do when I go back is patch them up. And by God, the first thing I do is I literally drill every single one of my guys, tell them, guys, this is what we're going to change, right? And guess what? We change. Mm-hmm. But I love the checks and balance system because imagine if there's no, if there's no checks and balance system. And imagine if there wasn't a higher legal authority or a higher other affiliation that would come and check up on you or when a customer has a concern or a customer has a complaint and they complained on you, you know, then that's when you have to make sure that you can prove that every single thing that you have is in order. And then like, look, everything is in order, right? So the female friendly thing, I believe, I know it's been a long time, it's been 2014 actually, it was the last time I signed up, it was something called Ask Patty, Ask P-H-D-Y, Ask Patty. It's a... It's like a assessment that you go through, um, whether, whether that then sh- whether, whether determines if you're female friendly or not, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a series of questions and it's a series of assessments that the whole shop has to go through. And then she basically tells you, like, you know, the, that our, that organization tells you, okay, you are female friendly or you're not female friendly. Now, a lot of stuff that was in that assessment, you know, um, you know, do I think that was very like relevant to the female friendliness part of it, you know, um, yeah, hundred percent. You know, the majority of it was very friendly and it was very educational, and we did learn a lot. And I was very, very thankful to be a part of that. You know, um, mm-hmm. it definitely teaches you a lot. And um, you forget if I'm wondering what, what does female friendly even mean? Like, yeah, that's like, just. A- I mean, so in oh, well, let me give you an example. There are videos out there where boyfriends will prank their girlfriends and tell them to go into an auto shop to ask for blinker fluid. And <laughs> come back there like, Dude. Right, right. So there's a lot of situations. Uh, but honestly, the biggest thing that I realized in that assessment is that I'm explaining the same way to Chima is the same way I should explain to any woman that comes in. I shouldn't make things dumber. You know what I mean? I shouldn't. Because that's, that's one of the biggest things that a lot of people don't realize is that you're, I'm educating both people. I'm educating a, a guy and I'm educating a girl. But a lot of people, when they're educating a girl, they might change their tone. Like, and I don't know, it could be sarcastic. Like, oh, and this, by the way, it does this, that, that. And they realize that. Like, okay, <laughs> now you're just treating, I understand I'm a woman, I don't know about my car, cars and stuff, but you don't have to treat me like an idiot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, it's like treating them the same. And like how you would treat any other customer. Um, and if they have any questions, not gonna ask the questions, you know? Mm-hmm. So for example, like if I assume that every male knows about you know the basic information about engines and suspensions and brakes, whatever, I'm gonna make majority of that assumptions the same as whatever assumptions I make, whatever I've set the bar for the basic knowledge, what I think for what majority of people know, I'm gonna apply that to male or female, you know, the same thing. Mm-hmm. There's no discrimination there, there's no segregation there. Treat them exactly the same. And, and then if they don't know, let them ask the question. So then I'll, like, I'll explain the engine. They're like, hey, Zara, by the way, I, I don't know what that part is. What, what is. what does that part do again? Then I'll go back and tell them, okay, well, this is what that does. That does you know? Instead of automatically assuming like, okay, she doesn't know what this is. So then I, then I literally start talking about Asia for five minutes, letting her know that her dad was a mechanic and she knows everything about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so not having preconceived, you know, notions and assumptions, you know, tr- equality of within your customer service. Mm-hmm. Um, with fact, particularly. Okay. So, Zor, uh, thank you so much for the time that you've given us. We've dropped in a lot of gems so far. We got two things left that we wanted to cover in this episode, and I think we'll probably have to do another follow up session after. Uh, so, the first thing is advertising. You touched on your spending, you were spending, what was it, 10000 5000 and well, now you're, you're spending thinking. fifteen. and now you're spending three, three to four. four. Uh, break, can you break down for us? where you're spending this money, what kind of returns you're seeing, uh, what are the, I mean, numbers are king, right? So what kind of numbers are, is your advertising budget driving? 
So advertising is one of the other things that I literally spent at least a good two, three years of my life literally just focusing on that, you know. Um, advertising is the, the, the fuel for every business, you know. You take advertising out, you're literally just running on fumes. So advertising has to be there. There can be no advertising. Um, when the advertising stops, the growth stops and business can, you have to be growing all the time. Uh, you're either growing or shrinking. No staying the same in business. <clears throat> um, as far as advertising is concerned, every industry has different advertising techniques and methods that work for them. So this is extremely specific. It comes back down to your target customers and your target clientele. Like everything keeps coming down to the same thing. Um, automotive, unfortunately, it is a very old school um, industry. And a lot of people, that paradigm has not changed yet. It's going to take some quite a bit of time. It could be 5, 10, 15, 20 years until that paradigm shifts. Um, but right now, it's still seen as that old school industry, you know. So in old school industry, one of the most effective methods is some old school stuff, right? What, is, what am I referring to as old school? What do you call direct mail? And now, what is direct mail? That mail inserts that you get in your mail. Really? So yeah. You're paying money for this? <clears throat> and that's the most, and by the way, that's the most expensive advertising that you can do. It's not Google, it's not Facebook, it's literally you selecting exactly which point paper, 4.5 point, 3 point exact paper, and you, it has to be the perfect size to fit in a standard mailbox. It has to be the perfect colors for, and this is about me, by the way, this is million dollar, multi-million dollar advertising companies that I hire to do this from me. I just learned from them so I could do it myself and save myself a bunch of money and it's still not cheap. So if I'm paying $15,000 for, it was paying $15,000 for direct mail, I'm technically getting $30,000 worth of mail for $15,000 just because I'm doing it myself because I learned from them. My, one of my biggest things in running Lean and Mean is you hire somebody to do something for you, you learn it from them, and then you do it yourself. As a business owner, you have to be like a freaking machine and you have to, and your business has to be an extremely well-oiled machine that just keeps pumping, but you have to be the machine that's driving it, right? And for you to do that, anything that your business comes across, learn it. I get it. I have an accountant. He does my tax. He does my payroll. I want to I learn everything that he knows. I have an advertising guy. He does my AdWords. I want to find out everything about Google AdWords if I can do it myself. Because that's how you, that's how you really cut costs. You don't cut costs by going cheap. You go cut costs by learning more and replacing those who are doing something for you and you do it yourself, right? So direct mail is one of the most effective, the most effective, and anybody in this industry will tell you the same thing. They're the most effective way of advertising um, across the board for all shop owners. Um, why? Because who's your target clientele? My target clientele are not the 20-year-old, 30-year-olds. For the most part, they're broke. 30, 40-year-olds, eh. 40 to 50-year-olds, okay. 50 to 60-year-olds, okay, right? 60, 70, eh, too old. So those guys, particularly, right, you find out which years they were born and what they're used to, things like that, right? When they check their mail, they see your coupon. Right, they see your, your insert. It's not even really a coupon. I don't want to say the word coupon because that's very misleading. You don't want to be a coupon shop. You give them your amazing direct mail piece with your picture on it, with your team's picture on it, your shop's picture on it. And you literally give them like a little quick tour on that nice thick paper gloss or nice like your colors on there and everything on there. So you basically have this much space, like, you know, maybe a size of a mailbox, like half a page of a printer paper front and back to literally make this customer a raving fan without even you, without them even calling you. So your reviews are on there. Your shop pictures are on there. All the brands that you serve, all those book car logos are on there, right? And they see it and they're blown away. They're like, and by the way, we're not going to send that mailer to anybody. We're going to only send that mailer to specific people targeting. Mm. We don't just flood the entire household. No. We only aim for those customers that have cars between a certain years that we all the data, demographics again. We're only going to shoot for those houses that make a certain amount of income. All these things, right? So we target that and then we target, you know, there are zip codes, there are sub-zip codes, 
And then there are carrier routes. Carrier routes. You know the mail mail the mailbox man that goes to the routes? Mm -hmm. Down to that. So I can literally hit the in out of the entire canton. I, I can only I can literally just choose Chima Street and only hit his street and that's it. And no one else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's how specific you can get. Right? Um uh, right. And you can't do each house, but unfortunately, but you can do each route, each route. So within zip code or sub zip code, within sub zip codes are routes. And then you monitor performance too. That okay, from Chima Street, Chima Street last year gave me thirty thousand dollars in revenue. So guess what? Let's keep advertising to them, right? And it's not a one-time deal. You have to keep reminding them because there are certain customers you'll get on, you'll get them on the first visit, the first card they get. Some customers will get them on the fifth. Some customers will get them on the hundred and twentieth. I had this guy come in. He brought seventy-five of my flyers over the past four years, and he's like, and he's like, look, I'm in. Stop sending me. So he's being fun. But he's like, consistency. You gotta keep hitting it. You gotta keep hitting it. You gotta keep hitting it, right? And he's like, listen, dude, I'm in. You got me, all right? You know, like he's being funny because he's like, dude, for the past four years, man, it's like clockwork. Every 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 month. Every on the last of the month, or the first of the month, or the middle of the month, Lord behold, there's a, there's a flyer, a your flyer in my in my in, in my uh, in my mail. And when I looked at it, because we change our proofs, we call it proof, you know, like when we change our design yeah. as a proof. We have addition, first edition proof, second edition proof. We're like on the thirty second edition of proof. I mean, we've changed our proofs thirty two times. This time by the fourth edition. This was like, <laughs> this was like from 20, March of twenty sixteen. I'm like, guy, this is twenty twenty. This is this is a relic. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, Neil, frame this thing, man. You know, like like I'm like you see what I mean. So that's what marketing tells you. Like, no matter what it is, you have to keep hitting it. Consistency, cons consistency wins the race, right? And that's what direct mail is. But that's just one. That's only one portion. Advertising is like a bunch of jars, right? And you have to put funds in each jar. But you put more funds in the jar that gives you the most revenue. Right, so my jars is direct mail, obviously the king of all. Then there is Google, the second. Then there is Facebook, right? Then there is affiliation shops, like you know, for example, BimmerShops.com. I'm on there. That's like only for BMW customers, right? There is RepairPal, right, which is like another affiliation. There's Bosch. There's a bunch of all different affiliations. So then there are also restaurant memberships that will host you on their website. And tell you that yes, this is one of our shops. You're certified by us. It's not just a paid membership. You have to. They have, they have to screen you. They have to interview you. They have to approve you, and then you, you know, become their a certified shop of their Carfax, for example. By the way, another thing, any work that you get done at Mechanic One is reported to Carfax. It's like a dealership. So if anybody wants mm -hmm. to buy a car, every single work that you've done at Mechanic One shows up on the Carfax. Oil change, oil change, oil change, oil change. So for example. Chima Bang is driving, you know, a lease, right? Or so sold it, okay? Yeah, it was, it was my car. So, but anyways, whoever buys his car, guess what? They can pull the car facts on it and they can say, look, Chima's been doing all of his own changes. And he doesn't have to worry about pulling up the records. He can say, look, this dude's been taking care of his car. That just made his car so much different from everybody else that's on their car. Because a lot of people have car facts, but a lot of car faxes don't have service records. Only dealerships that went to have service records on the car fax. Okay. So there's a lot of different, you know, well, things on that too. Yeah, one thing I want to just touch on real quick is that, you know, when you're advertising, the point is you have to stick out, yes. right? And so what, what Zar is saying reminds me of another story. Uh, you've heard this story on the future podcast with Errol Grayson, where he talks about he was trying to get his first job and he realized that everyone is using the same paper, the same font and everything, right? So what he did is what you literally pick nice, like quality paper, change the font, and then he made the actual resume one eighth of an inch taller than uh, the regular 8.5 by 11. And so he only sent it to like one or two companies uh, and he made like that one eighth of an inch like red, so it stood out. So a week later he gets a call and the call, the guy's like, dude, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, I know why. He's like, you you tried to stack your red folder of resumes and whatever, and one was just sticking out, and that was my resume, right? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. Like, how did you know? And so that's the point. Like with direct mail, with with actually with anything, with any form of advertising, 
you want to be that one eighth of an inch that people remember. And I'll give you a direct example of how to be that one eighth of an inch in direct mail. If you guys think about it, right? And I don't, a lot of, especially people our age, we really don't check the mailbox that much, right? I have to do everything, digit email, you know, auto pay, everything, whatever. But our parents, they still check the mail. Yeah. You're, those are my customers, right? They have money, they have cars, right? Those are my customers. These guys, for the most part, when they go out to the mailbox and when they go on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, how much junk is in that mailbox? A lot. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be part of that junk? No. So you have to literally time your, when is the mailbox the most empty? Mm -hmm. During the middle of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday. So when they go check the mail on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday around there, guess what? Who's all the individual pieces there is yours. That's <laughs> sort of them, right? Sort of, right? So then basically, mm -hmm. guess what? Not only is your piece attractive, not only is your piece sticks out, not only are you serving car nobody else's, but guess what? You're the only piece in the mailbox. Yeah, it's like bills, bills. Oh, what is this? <laughs> 100%. You're the only advertising because all the big corporate retailers, JC Penney, Macy's, whoever, they're flooding your mailbox on weekends, you know, because they realize their business model is like, on the weekends you're home and you're going through mail. So guess what? Flooded. I'm like, everybody else is flooding your mailbox. Let me get you in the middle, during the middle of the week, mm -hmm. right? So that's that one eighth of an inch. There. That's powerful. Abdulmanan, why don't you close us off with the, uh, the example that you had? All right, this is going to get a little uh, steamy, Zar. You ready for it? 100%. I'm going to try to set this up right just so we can make it productive. Um, so I've been going through some of your reviews. Mashallah, they've been really good for the most part. And then there's some that are like at the opposite end. It's almost like a bimodal distribution of reviews. It's either, which is interesting because actually I've seen that on Amazon a lot. So I guess it happens often. But one thing I noticed in the reviews that were on the lower end, because I kind of want to talk, I want, I want our audience to hear how an owner thinks about this, right? That's the end goal of this conversation. Um, one thing I noticed about the ones that are at the lower end, there seems to be a certain theme I want you to address. And that theme is basically that customers have found that when they come to your shop, they get a specific price quote for a fix. But then um, that price quote goes up and up and up as you figure out more things. Now that's one part of the like quote unquote problem. Now the other part from what I've heard from an inside person at your shop <laughs> is that um, you have this model where you, instead of trying to fix, figure out what the problem is, A, B, or C, i.e. like for example, sensor A, sensor B, sensor C, um, you go to fix the entire thing and charge that premium price. And it seems to be a deliberate decision from your end um, can you walk us through what your decision making process is and why it is that way? 100%, 100%. Like I said, one thing about running a business, um, a good business, or I guess the business to the best of your ability is it gives you the ability to be transparent, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> the, as far as the negative reviews, thank you for doing that, actually, uh, because that's something that we do part of our training is we literally go to our negative reviews and we contact each and every single person that left a negative review to literally tell them, give us a second chance. What can, what can we do? You know, do you want a refund? Do you want a partial? Anything we can do, right? Um, and you'd be surprised a lot of people, we're the one making the phone calls. We're the one sending the emails. We're sending the one text. They don't want to, they don't want to hear, right? <laughs> In this business or any business, you can't make everybody happy. You know, that's just the basic philosophy of it. Uh, and majority of time, reviews are going to be polar opposite because how often do people leave a three-star, four-star review? They have to be, in order for you to, for, for a consumer, for you to cause them to have a behavior, an act, um, they have to be influenced very strongly, right? And not like your team is like, eh, it was okay. He's not going to leave a review, right? He either has to be extremely happy. Or either has to be extremely upset because every action that we do, there's a motive behind it, right? And that motive mm -hmm. drives you, right? It has to be mm -hmm. motivation for any action that you do, even just anything. You go to the bathroom because, dude, your stomach hurts, you gotta pee, right? But if that pain was never there, then you don't go. But I'm just using a blunt example. Um, so that's where the counter opposite stuff reviews come there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, as far as a lot of that goes back to my first point. And I hate to say this, you know. Um, 
no matter how good your training gets, no matter how talented people you find and the best training you can give them, at the end of the day, it never replaces the owner and the owner's touch. Majority of those reviews that are there is when either A, I'm not on vacation, B, not at the shop, right? Uh, and as an owner, you get to pay for that in two ways. You get to pay that. And that's one thing I want to learn. I want everyone to know about before they open their business. Just like you guys said, every, every, not everything that shines is gold, right? I don't know if I butchered that saying, but um, you know, people think that business entrepreneurs and business owners are living this lavish life. So sure, we have the luxury of having funds, but we also have the luxury and the the consequences that come with it, right? Um, when you take time off, you don't not just get paid, you lose money, mm. you lose reputation, right? Um, mm. And that's the thing. As a human being, you can, you're not a superman. That's one thing that you also realize when you're running a business is that you want to do everything yourself, you're the machine, but you also have your internal, and this is, you know, if you guys want, we can do a whole separate section on growth or whatnot, self-development and whatnot, you know, this is very personal. Um, but we all have a battery inside ourselves too, you know, that burnout. Um, and we can't, we can't just go in, you know, when I would say, excuse me for the language, but balls to the wall, you know, every single week, <laughs> 60, 70 hours a week, dude, you're going to get burned out eventually, right? Yeah. And when you get burned out, what do you do? You're going to take that break. And when you take that break, guess what's going to happen? Those losses are going to creep up on you because mm-hmm. you're negative reviews are going to pile up. Because no one can do that. The, as the job that you're doing in your own business, nobody can replace that. They'll try. My quota is literally as when I try to hire a manager or a service writer or whoever to deal with customers. I'm like, if you can just do 75% of what I can do, bravo. Forget 100%. Are you kidding me? Forget 98%. Be realistic. 75%, if you can do it, I'm happy. Right? Be extremely realistic. So that's the negative reviews. Um, a lot of the negative reviews, unfortunately, are people that go to the old chain place next door thinking it's us because we're connected, <laughs> right? That's, there's that. And then also, I don't want to paint the negative reviews with one paintbrush because that's not doing it justice. There's all sorts of people over there. There are people that came to the shop when Donald's not there. There are people that came to, went to the next shop thinking it was us left us a review. We flipped our database, they're not in our database. So you reply to them, tell us to contact us. Even though you're not in our database, whatever they broke, we'll fix it. You know? <laughs> Hell, we'll do it for free. Just take the negative review off. You know what I mean? They don't answer. <laughs> you don't get back to us at all. You know, we're always trying to work. People, the, the, the best thing you can do as a business owner is reply to their negative review online. The amazing thing that you can do as a business owner is reply and contact them in whichever mm-hmm. way, right? We literally go next door and be like, listen, this lady left us a negative review. Can you give us our phone number so we can call them? And, and they're mm-hmm. jerks. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't give us the number. But when we get that number, any contact, we contact them. If we had an email, we can Google find, you can Google their name, you can find the email. My guys have gone to an extent where they've literally added them on LinkedIn just to tell them. <laughs> You came to no, my head and wanted 100%. These people found it. This is going to be creepy, but this just wanted to show that the length that we're going to go. And, and you yeah. guys are only going to be as good as you are. I tell them to do whatever it takes. Yeah. Add them on Facebook. Find them on Instagram. <laughs> tell them you left a review for the wrong, wrong goddamn shop. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and like I said, but, and it's so yeah. that. And the third thing is everybody is patient with stupidity, but not with ignorance. And this is a quote, you know, I'm patient with stupidity, but I'm not, I'm not patient with ignorance. Mm-hmm. A lot of customers, not a lot of customers, but unfortunately this month, but I don't know what it is. I mean, it's time of the year. Or I don't know what it is. This is something I've yet to figure out. Maybe there, maybe there's nothing to figure out in this, but a lot of customers, you try to educate them and you try to teach them. They just, they just don't want to listen. They're the mm-hmm. same people that will come and say, Hey, They'll come to a doctor and say, well, first they'll come, come to a doctor and say, hey, my, I have a heart burn, okay? Um, can you tell me what's wrong with me? And then the doctor will do the inspection and diagnosis and find out that, okay, you have a clogged, you know, stent, you know, or a clogged artery, whatever. And the customer's like, no, you don't know what's wrong. You don't know what's wrong. You know, I'm, my, 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 my artery's not clogged. Give me, I want this medication. Give me this medication. And the doctor doesn't look at you. <laughs> Really? <laughs> this is my job. This is literally my job. You came to me. Yeah. I didn't come to you. Come to me. 
And you're <laughs> asking you to find out your problem. I told you the answer to your problem. You don't like the answer. You want something else. I can't give you that. I will lose my license over that if I give you freaking Prozac because you freaking need a, like, a stent put in your heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That's what uh, I'm saying. A lot yeah. of people come in and they're literally like over the phone. My daily conversation. That's what I'm saying. You're a lot of patients for this, man, because this is no different than the medical industry. I swear to you. We're just car doctors. This is exactly how it goes. I just give you a, a medical example. Yeah. Every phone call that we get, I mean, ninety percent of phone calls that we get every single day. I need control arms. How much for control arms? Okay. Um, can I ask you a few questions first? And this is our phone procedure. Okay. Let's start out with what kind of car do you have? I have this car. Okay. What kind of concerns are you having? What's going on? Are you hearing clumping over when you go over bumps? Are you feeling loose your string? Why do you need control arms? And this is see, look at look at how they're replying to their voice. I'm looking at the voice that we're replying to, right? Mm -hmm. Calm, collective. Well, let 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 me just find out what's going on here. Like, why do you need control arms? Do you take it to a mechanic? Do you take it to a leadership? They told you need control arms. No, I just need control arms. Give you price some control arms. Okay, fine. I'll give you price some control arms. But if I fix this control arm, then whatever concern that you're having that you're not telling me is still there. Who are you gonna be mad at? Mm -hmm. Right? You fix my control, the noise is still there. Because guess what? That noise is never the control arms, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you have two, two, two different types of customers. Customers that you educate and they learn and customers that are not having it, right? Because mm -hmm. either they've been so fed up with other shops, they hear this is, my, I'm their fifth shop that they called, I'm their sixth, seventh shop that they're visiting, whatever. They've had it, they don't want to hear anything, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can't deal with those people, right? So yeah. anytime a procedure is, anytime a customer calls to get a price on something, want to get something done, we always ask them, let me just be frank with you. Why do you need it? Investigate mm -hmm. the problem. Before you can fix a problem, any problem in life, in cars, in any business, you have to first investigate the problem. What is it? So then we get the real problem. The real problem is not them asking for a price. The real problem is their concern, whatever concern they're having with the car. Then mm -hmm. we combat them by telling them it's a free inspection. And that's why we blow them away because every people, everybody charges for inspections. You're sure everybody. You tell them it's a free inspection, bring it by, no obligation. And even if you've got it checked out at the dealership with the unit control arms, guess what? Second opinion, right? And 99% of the times, what they think they need and what we find is totally different. Really? 99% of the times. What? Like, it's a car that's been either misdiagnosed at the dealer or somewhere else, whatever. We just found out that a control arm never needs to be replaced. The ball drain just needs to be either looped up or adjusted. Or guess what? It wasn't even that. It was the tire rod that had moved on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So majority of times that's that, but a lot of these customers that you know leave negative reviews and whatnot, our procedure is very, very simple. Free inspection, find out what's going on. If it's if it's something that the free inspection can solve and we need more time to investigate and diagnose the problem, then we get that more time and then we tell you the answer. And then mm -hmm. that's the solution to your problem. And then we ask your authorization to do inspection on the rest of the car. If there's anything else that you will let you know. So those majority of those those customers there is a lack of communication or some sort of uh, a disconnect in our procedure that we have and them fitting in. There, at some point, this is the treatment. Free inspection, imagine this is a hospital. Free inspection, diagnosis if needed, if not, go straight to the surgery and then let you know the overall health of the rest of your body. This is our procedure. This is our, like, you know, our healthcare plan. Okay, yeah. Right. This is literally at, at some point in this process, something just they're not complying. You see what I mean? They're literally not complying. And our procedure is the same with every single person, person, every single customer, every single car. Mm -hmm. Because everyone's a call, anyone that'll call on the phone, figure out their concern, right? It doesn't matter, right? Now the best part about the phone people is that if they don't want to play ball. They just hang up and we're like, thank God, we got rid of that problematic customer, right? Because we don't want them further down our process. The further yeah, down yeah. we get, the more problematic it is, right? Second thing is they come in for inspection or diagnosis needed or whatever. And we're just literally going step by step with them. And before the next step comes, we tell them. We tell them free inspection. If it's something that we're going to need more time with and more diagnosis needed, we'll let you know. And it's your option. At the end of the day, it's always your car. We're not holding you by a gunpoint or we're not holding you hostage or car hostage, anything. It's your car, your decision. You do whatever you want to do with it, right? <laughs> Well, one of the, one of the comments one of the comments made it seem like they were held at gunpoint. They were like, "You guys were calling them to <laughs> to like really make you know." 
and, and that's that's another thing, right? A lot of these absurd, absurd, absurd comments that you see, unfortunately, is left by competitors, particularly the you know the OGM place next door to us, you know, because mm. they see that we're growing like wildfire. We have double, triple the review there, right? And their owner particularly admitted to leaving a lot of negative reviews to us, right? But that's like I said, that's a punch below the belt, right? I never like to engage. I could have gotten his. Every, uh, Google page and left like 20, 30 reviews and told everybody in the canton like, hey, he's the strongest guy, right? <laughs> but no, man, focus on your own growth, you know, and and, and when people start, you know, when, when you, sometimes in life when you develop haters, that's when you know you're doing something right, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the thing. There's, there's a good mix of, of uh, variety in like, negative reviews and believe it or not, some of them we actually dropped the ball on. You know, that we actually could have done better. We actually skipped a step or something wasn't explained correctly or something is miscommunicated, right? So that negative review, unfortunately, isn't a, a one one answer fix all, you know? There's a mm -hmm. very, very mixture of things in there. Um, so I hope that answers the first question. Yeah, that's a good transition actually to the second part where we talk about, for example, like the model where you fix everything versus, you know, Potentially spending more time to find the one problem. Exactly. So this uh, not to throw not to throw any shade at anybody, <coughs> but um, <coughs> trainees, right? Uh, especially when they've been in the an environment for a very short amount of time, um, miscommunication usually comes and misunderstanding usually comes due to only because of one thing: lack of knowledge, right? And the more you spend time in a place, the more you understand, the more you learn, the more knowledge you gain, the more lack of knowledge gap closes and closes, right? So unfortunately, like I said, this, this problem with the tool, treaty situation, not understanding our procedure and et cetera, et cetera, I can see how this can be very clearly, you know, mis uh, <coughs> misidentified. This procedure that you're particularly referring to where instead of why don't we just go in and fix one thing, why do we fix the whole thing? This is called isolation. Isolation. This, is, this procedure is called isolation. And to explain to you what isolation is, for example, in cars, we don't have just parts. We have systems, and in systems, we have parts. For example, I mean, anyone of any mechanical engineering, electrical engineering background, <coughs> this would be a little bit more sense too. But just speaking in layman's terms, um, let's just talk under the hood. Under the hood, there are different systems. There is the engine cooling system, which is responsible for keeping the engine cool, where all the energy flows through. This consists of your radiator hoses, your water pump, your thermostat, your coolant temperature sensor, your radiator. All these things are part of the engine cooling system. That is one system. The second system is your AC system. That's designed to keep you cool. That consists of the AC condenser, the AC compressor, the AC cooler line, the evaporator, the receiver, the dryer, the orifice tube. All that is the AC system, right? So I can just go on and on about these systems, but you guys get the idea, right? There are different systems yeah. throughout the car. Now, when things fail, when anything on a car fails, this is the general rule of thumb that a lot of shops don't understand, a lot of owners don't understand, a lot of mechanics don't understand, um, is you don't isolate parts, you isolate systems. Why? I'll give you an example. Abdulmanan has this, and by the way, I want objections and I want any loopholes you guys find in this year, so please let me know. Abdulmanan has this Honda Accord, and basically, he has a coolant leak and he comes into the shop and his lower radiator hose is leaking coolant. And let's just say, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's just say the water pump is leaking and a freeze. And you replace the water pump and it's good to go, right? <clears throat> That's the only defective component in the, in the system is just the water pump. Um, but in order for you to replace the water pump, you have to take apart the upper hose, the lower hose, the coolant temp sensor, whatever in the area, or even if you don't in the area, those parts are still old. So let's just say scenario number one, Abdulmanan comes in with a leaking, leaking water pump and I am an untrained person and I'll, I'll say, Abdulmanan, your water pump is leaking, let's replace the water pump. And you approve the water pump, you replace the water pump. But guess what? The leak is fixed, right? Because that's the only part that's leaking. But guess what? Abdulmanan doesn't know much about cars, a lot of people, like, like a lot of people. And all he knows is coolant leak leaking and coolant leak fixed. You don't even know what part was replaced. Majority yeah. of people don't even know what part, they don't even care. You know, just like leak or no leak, right? Leak fixed, yeah. okay, you know, like, like caveman, you know? So <laughs> I don't blame them. That's the thing. You should throw a lot of mechanics. You have, to, you have to grow above that. You have to realize and understand that we're living in a society and it's not their job to know about cars. That person that you're talking to is probably a nurse. 
He knows about yeah. the business, getting rid of this person you're talking to. See, everybody has their own trait. So don't bash anybody for not having the knowledge because guess what? That's not their field. That's not their job to know. It's your mm-hmm. job to know and it's your job to educate them, right? Whether they would choose to accept it or not is on them. So now Abdul Manan's water pump leak is fixed, all right? And I don't know, a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, a month later, six months later, even a year later, the car is being cooled again. Who's, who's the first person to blame? Me. Why? Because I was the last person to touch it. Right? I was the last person to touch it. Does he know about cars? No. Abdul Manan now comes back to the shop and he's, he's, he's upset. Zara paid $500 for the water pump and my car is still leaking energy. Like, what's going on? Now, I tell Abdul Manan, the water pump is fine. And Lord behold, the water pump is fine. It's under warranty, everything's good. It doesn't fail again within that short of time. It's the radiator hose leaking. And I tell Abdul Manan, the radiator hose leaking and Abdul Manan is not having it. He's like, dude, you know, I don't care, man. All I, I paid for a cool leak. Whether it was a week ago, two weeks ago, six weeks ago. And he's like, dude, I, I fixed a leak and the leak is leaking again. And guess what? First you said it was the water hose, now you're saying. No, it's a radiator hose. And, and by the way, then guess what? Three weeks later, it comes back again for the leak. And now it's the other hose. Right? Yeah. yeah. So so he keeps bringing the car back for the same problem, which is the coolant leak. But they're different kind of, different components. Yeah. yeah. Good luck explaining that one to him. <laughs> As a person who's been doing this for 11 years, good luck explaining that to him. Yeah. yeah. And yes. how, does, how does that make you look as a shop? Terrible. How does that make you look as a mechanic? Terrible. How much of that is your fault? Zero. How much of that customer that doesn't understand? He doesn't understand 100% of it. And then guess what? <laughs> it's not his job to understand 100% of it because all he cares about is the coolant leak and the dollar amount, right? Yeah. So, so how do we combat the issue? And I'll speak from the sociological aspect and from a, a logistical aspect. Why is it that Abdul Manan's <coughs> radio holes is, is failing? Why is it that Abdul Manan's other cooling components are failing? Now they replace the water pump. Clearly, we must have done something wrong because all these things are happening within a few weeks. Wrong. Those hoses, those coolant temperature sensors, all that. When you go in a system, you have disrupted that system now. You see what I mean? When you're in a system, everything's mm-hmm. old. How do car has 120,000 miles? It's 2008. The entire cooling system is 13 years old, and the entire system has 128,000 miles. Now you went into that system. You disrupted that system by putting a new water pump in there. Do you think those rest of the cooling components? Can they handle the new pressure that's coming from water pump? Do you? You uh-huh. don't. You don't. So what do you do? Yeah. You fix it once, you fix it right. So yeah. when we go into a system, the biggest mistakes that all of my newbie service writers and managers make is they're too afraid and too unskilled and too unknowledged to isolate the whole system. We always isolate the whole system because the customer doesn't want to keep going. The customer would rather pay a whole lump sum amount of money once. Abdul Manan was much comfortable paying, doing the water pump, the upper radiator holes, the lower radiator holes, the cooling tents, and the whole system because it would be cheaper on labor doing all together. And he has no problem being that car done for a day or two instead of keep coming back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for the next three, four months. He's going to be, yeah, yeah. be out of a car. He's going to need all these other components, right? So this is why we isolate. Isolation, this is called isolation. We don't just go into a part, into a car, just one thing. Anything that's connected with it, if it's old and if it's worn out, and if we know that this part can cause these parts to fail later, 100% you stay, do it once, do it right. The customer will be happy, you'll be happy, everybody wins. Uh, is there any room in this area for, you know, we've, we've, we've nuanced out our target audience. Is there any room in this area to nuance out our customers who, for example, might want to only replace one part or understand the idea that, hey, I'm taking that risk, uh, running, I'm running, I know I'm running the risk of just paying for that small thing, uh, and I know that I might come back later. Is there any room for nuance there? 100%, and that depends. It very, very depends. Now, that depends on how problematic of a customer you'll be, right? Majority mm-hmm. of times, we don't, if we're not going to do it our way, because remember, are you the expert or are we the experts, mm-hmm. right? So when the doctor is telling you, no, you need this surgery and you need not, you don't, or for example, you, don't, you just don't need to take this one medication. You need to take all four of these medications. You're saying, I don't need this four medication, I just need one. And in reality, you can just get back with one. But those three, you're taking, those three medications you're taking as a precaution to make sure there's no inflammation anywhere else. 
right? Yeah. Like, yeah. My, my entire family is a doctor. My sister is a doctor. I've, all my cousins, all my uncles, everybody's a doctor, right? When I, I, I have, say that's a really good example. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, I'm telling you, like, um, you know, a lot of a lot of doctors in our family, and when I, the more I tell them about automotive, they're dying laughing. They're like, "Holy crap! Our our customers are the same. <laughs> they're the same people who are neglecting auto repair. The same people that are neglecting their own health. The same people that are neglecting your telling them what their car needs. Are the same people that are, that are fighting us on the on the treatment. They're so stubborn. <laughs> they're so freaking stubborn, right? They're like, dude, we don't want to take this. And we're like, dude, come on! I've been doing this for a long time, and especially doctors. Like, you guys went to med school, residency, freaking like, you have your fellowship. Fellowship, release, fellowship, and then you have some freaking Joe Schmo coming to and telling you that what he need, what, what he thinks he needs. <laughs> it's insulting. And I, and, I don't, and, I, and I don't, I literally, that's why, that's why I, I like, I, 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 I'm, I empathize and sympathize with both sides. I, I, I understand why the mechanics get pissed off because they're like, who are you? To tell me, yeah, like, yeah. like take, you don't believe me? Just go take your car to another mechanic or a dealership. They'll tell you, right? Yeah, and yeah. and right, and then the doctor, same thing too. Like my sister, she's a doctor, right? And she she tells them like someday, you know, like hey, lady, like she comes in hard to hard burns or whatever, and all this issues. And she's like, you know, Joanne, are you still smoking? Yeah, I'm still smoking, but that's got nothing to do with it. And she's just like, <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? I told you to stop smoking. This is. Like seventy five percent of your problem is because you literally smoke a pack a day, and right? Yeah. And then now you're having like all these other conditions that are coming from it, blah blah blah. But they don't listen, right? So you can only yeah. at the end of the day, you can only help those who listen, right? That comes back to the first point, you know. Yeah. But your point, as far as if a customer only wants one thing done, then we're gonna number one, we're not gonna do that job for the most part because we don't want that liability. Because at the end of the day. It's less profitable for us. And the second thing is bad for reputation because 95%, I want to say out of 100 customers, 95, that's how high the rate is. And this is me not just throwing numbers out there. This is actual data. 95 cars who have not been isolated properly will come back for a similar problem. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Wow. And guess what? Those customers for the second time, they're not going to pay. You want those guys yeah. to do with you. Literally, like that water pump is perfectly fine, but they were like, Zahar, I don't care what you tell me. My car I was leaking coolant two weeks ago and it's still leaking. And then you, you literally will bring heaven and earth to the, together for them. And they would be like, no, no, I don't care. Zahar, stop getting, literally, quote unquote, Zahar, stop getting technical with me. All right? Yeah. I just want my coolant leak fixed. I paid you 500 bucks last week to fix it. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? And then I was like, what do you mean not get technical with you, bro? This is literally your hose is leaking. Come, take a look at it yourself. I send them pictures, they're not having it. Yeah. I send them a video, they're not having it. I literally raise the car up in the air, bring them underneath the car, they're not having it, right? Yeah. So it's not even just about business. I don't want to do it because I don't want to, as, as, as an individual, as a human being, as a business owner, as a mechanic, I don't want to deal with you, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you, like, straight up, I, I have the right yeah. to refuse business to anyone. We've got plenty of work. Totally. You, you, you brought your car to me because you trust me and you're, you're using my expertise. I'm giving you my expertise. If you're not going to do my way, definitely take the highway because your way is too much liability for me. I don't want another bad Google review. So I can't do it your way, right? I'm only going to do it my way and this is the way to do it because it works, mm-hmm. right? Anytime we go in the system, it's cheaper and easier to replace everything in the area. And I'm not talking about replace every, everything. I'm just talking about whatever is relevant, whatever is connected. For example, yeah. brake pads, right? Majority of times, the only, like, I can't even remember last time it was just brake pads. Anytime we do brake pads, always change the rotors too because they're immediately connected, right? Unless you have a car that has perfect rotors, I'll wait, you know? <laughs> there's, there's literally either scarring on the rotor. And that's another thing. A lot of customers don't understand what makes a part worn or defective. And like I said, it's not their job to find out, right? A lot of customers will say, oh, my rotor is, uh, it's smooth, so it's fine. Like, okay, well, have you seen that? Have you checked on the heat spots? Have you checked the millimeter thickness on it? And I'm not going to name you, but a particular friend who work on these cars, by, those are the best, by the way, those who work on self self proclaimed mechanics that work on the cars in the garage. He's like, bro, you told me my brakes are at 15%. They're not at 15%. I'm like, hmm, who died and gave you a measuring gauge for the brakes? You know, did you measure them? No. Do you know what millimeters they're supposed to be at? No. Did you know what millimeters they're, they're at? No. <laughs> okay, so why do you think they're not at fifteen percent, right? And then like like I just it just baffles me, you know. Like the thing is that 
Um, that's the whole thing. There's so many reasons behind isolation too, because isolation is to protect ourselves. And like I said, it goes back to the same theory. Customers are willing to pay more. The biggest inconvenience for a person who owns cars is to be without it. Because the majority of people have one car. And when the car is, and let me tell you this, dentists are one of the most depressed, and I don't know if you guys know this statistically, but they're one of the most yeah. depressed and the highest suicide rates and all this stuff. Why? Because everybody hates going to the dentist. Imagine if 100% of your customers are, are literally just it's like, they hate you. And you, you're not doing anything but fixing their teeth and they just hate you. You're going you're gonna to hate yourself, right? And, and it gets personal. Other oh, oh. are exactly the same. Other yeah. are unexpected, they're expensive, and everybody and their mama projects their, their problems onto you. Mm. Oh, well, now my car is down, I can't pick up my kids from school, and how am I going to get to work? At the same time, you're realizing this is none of your problem. Yeah. It's just your defensive, but you get to hear all that. So <laughs> being without a car is one of the biggest inconveniences. It's not the money. They just need to get around. And they can't yeah. get around because the car is down. Right? Mm -hmm. Now we help with giving them free loaners, but some we don't have we only have like six, seven loaners. We're trying to change and have more and more loaners, but we don't have like a fleet of 30 loaners, right? Yeah. So idea here is, is that you want to get them in and out as fast as possible and then not see them again for a long time, right? If mm -hmm. you are a vehicle owner, you just want to be a one-stop shop, maybe go to a shop once a year and then just profit money, go to a shop for like another two, three years, unless we're all changing this stuff. So that's why we built this procedure. This procedure is not just for us. It's realizing mm -hmm. over the course of 10, 11 years of beating our head against the wall and saying, dude, what can we do? What can we change to change, shift this paradigm, right? Where customers can see come when you can make money and keep your customers happy, right? Mm -hmm. And so just have that one opportunity when that customer comes in with Rob Dumanan comes comes from a leak on his car, guess what? I'm like, I'm doing not drop off your cord. I already have a loaner pulled around. I'm doing it here. Here's your loaner car. Hop in this loaner car. This is all yours. Come in, find out the water pump is leaking. Look at the condition. I'm not just a water pump, but the entire components, everything. Was the radiator hose a warning? Recommend them. Coolant condenser might leak in the near future? Recommend it. Okay, um, you know, thermostats sticking a little bit, still doing the job of sticking, recommend it, right? Call up the Milan, replace the cooling system, whatever it is. I'm not gonna go for the reader, there's nothing wrong with it, I'm gonna replace it with it. And it's connected, it's worn out, and may cause problems in the future, you betcha. I'm gonna go and recommend all that to you. You're gonna approve it, you just have the money, by the way, we have financing options, no credit check, no, no, none of that stuff either. We get 100 days to pay off your bill, even better. You fix your car and have to pay off your bill for 100 days, no credit check, no nothing, literally, just a payment plan. Just to help you out the money too, by the way. Third thing, I'm gonna ask for your permission. It's like the whole entire time, I'm just me asking your permission. Well, this is what we found, you want us to fix it? Go ahead. Okay, now that you've authorized to fix your cooling system, after we're done with the car, we're gonna test drive the car five miles city, five miles highway, we're gonna make sure that this car is not leaking a drip of coolant. Then, we're going to go an extra step. We're going to do a full inspection on the rest of the car for you. And if there's anything else, even a speck of dust that needs to be brought to your attention, we're going to let you know. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, it's free. Is it free? Heck yeah, it's free. Okay, do it. So now we just did the full inspection and then I come back to Abdulman and tell him, Abdulman, your brakes are worn out, your shocks are worn out, your shirts are worn out. And then by the way, who has the buying and holding power in him? You get to decide whatever you want to do. And then You'll tell me, oh, sorry, I'm already spending $1,000. Now you're hitting with that after $1,500 bill. Listen, I'm not. It's your car. The more you put out in this car, the more you're going to get out of it. And you can choose not to get anything done. But I'm just doing my job. You, you brought this car for me to take a look at. My job is to let you know every single thing that's going on with you. It's like a, it's like a doctor. It's like a hospital. Now, it's your job. Whether you want the treatment or not, if you want the treatment now or later, that's up to you. That's none of my business. My business is to report the news. That's it. So that being said, you go ahead and uh, either approve the work or don't. But either way, the point is either you're going to get everything done so you're set for the next year or two, unless any unexpected thing comes up that has nothing to do with this because I always tell everybody, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't predict what other, anything that you replaced with us is never going to fail. It's warranted for two years, 24,000 miles, all that good stuff. But I can't guarantee anything else on the car, obviously, that has nothing to do with us, right? But from the way the car sits and stands right now, if you take care of everything that you take care of, logistically and, and rationally, everything that's going on in the car, you take care of, you should be good to go for the next year or two. The majority of people are. And then we don't see them for the next year or two. Right? And they're at the same, and during this time, this year or two, they're driving their car, guess what they're doing? 
raving fans. Like, sure, I spend a lot of money, but look, I've never not had to go to the shop for a year and a half, two years, just for watching. That's never happened before. Second thing, the, the service was great. I got loaner cars. Everything was educational. Everything was explained to me up front. Everything was extremely detailed. All of that, you know. So that's our system. It's it's inspection, isolation, and then the rest is called the, the full inspection is called PMI, preventative preventative maintenance inspection. Preventative. You don't want in life. You never want to be reactive. You are, when you are reacting to things, it's already too late. It's already half happened. You have to be preventative. Reaction and response are two different things. Reaction is you literally, things have already happened, you're reacting to it. It's too late. Response is you're responding to something before it even happened, you know, or preventative, right? So staying one, one step ahead of the game. And this is a procedure that, this is not a mechanics home procedure, by the way. Isolation PMI, God forbid, I'm not going to take credit for this. This is something that hundreds and hundreds of the sharpest shop owners in the entire country have developed. One of the one of them, is the, I would call him the auto repair mogul. He is like the benchmark. His name is Greg Sands, a good friend of mine, by the way. He owns over four hundred shops. He has helicopter. That he, he literally has so many shops that he literally goes from helicopter to go shop to shop. The majority <laughs> of this, these procedures, like fifty percent, he has the hand in. He has sold over three billion dollars in auto automotive repair. Wow. You can look him up, Greg Sands. He's on he's on LinkedIn with me. He's endorsed me for automotive as well. Hey, so hey. literally, Greg Sands is the legend. Greg Sands is the pinnacle. He was at 35, he was a manager at Applebee's, and he decided that, you know what? I'm gonna open up. And he has he speaks sort of the southern accent, you know, the he's an amazing great guy. Uh, he's, I think he's from he's from down south. The majority of the really, really sharp auto, auto shop owners, they're all from down south. So they have the southern hospitality, these people have the southern accent. So Greg Sands was like, you know. I was gonna go build my, you know, build my own shops, you know, and just like that. And I, I, I do the most terrible impersonation of Southern accent. <laughs> but this guy, literally, at age thirty-five, he decided to build his empire, right? Or age thirty-five, age whatever, after being managing Applebee's, and he went to four hundred locations. That's how much he scaled it. And then he turned around and, and sold like 50, 60 locations to different groups, like different like Midas or Meineke or whoever big giants, for so much cash. And he was the one, he's a coach. He coaches other shop owners on what to do, what not to do. And isolation, PMI, this is his scripts. These are his procedures. We just took them, picked them up a little bit, but this is the basic one stop shop. I want to make a point here, you, you. real quick. I want to add on. So, this laptop that I'm recording this on got this in 2014. And at the time, you know, like, uh, in our family, and then like, you know, in our community, like, you know, Apple is like, you know, it's for rich people, yeah, right? And so like, when I got it, it was, like, I it was, <laughs> yeah. it was like, dude, you're spending a thousand dollars on a computer. And so it's been 2014 to 2021. How many years is that? Seven years. I'm still, like, I'm recording a podcast on here. Guess how many times I've been to the Apple store? Twice, once? Once. Once. I have a 2011 MacBook Pro sitting upstairs with me, all right? In a time where nobody wanted an Apple. I wanted an Apple, right? <laughs> my brother got it for me for 1300 bucks for my 18th birthday. I bought myself the Porsche, obviously. Um, and basically, he literally, I remember, he had it in the fridge. He was like, hey, I'm open up the fridge. I guess it's a surprise. And I saw it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I still use that thing till this day. I upgraded the RAM to 16 gigs. And guess what? I've never been to the Apple store. That's great. Yeah. That, and that's, I mean, 16 gigs of RAM. Two terabytes of SSD, all right, and it runs faster than most new computers. I've never, I've never, I've, that first laptop from Apple, I've never looked back. I've used, been using PC my entire life, but since 2011 and on, I've been straight, straight Mac. So, so yeah, I just wanted to add on, like, Ratchet and Wrench, when they interviewed you guys, one of the things that they highlighted is, like, Mechanic One is the Apple of automotive repair. And I think this philosophy that you're getting into is, like, exactly how Apple kind of conducts their business. The other thing is, like, this, like a month ago, it came time, I had a new space, we just moved. And so I wanted to get like a bigger monitor. And so I was like, man, might as well just get another computer, get some more stuff. And so guess what I got? Apple Cinema Display? No, 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 I didn't. <laughs> no, I that was that cool. <laughs> I got the Mac Mini. Oh, nice. Right? Okay. So I got the Mac Mini and I got a, a big monitor and stuff like that. And so like, 
It's because I know like this will last me at least. I got two. Years. I got two twenty-seven inch iMacs on the counter. All right. I got another twenty-four inch iMac on my on our dining table with my MacBook Pro. So that just shows that I'm so and every single thing, every new iPhone that comes out. By the way, I've had the, I've had the iPhone. Since the very first iPhone, since 2007, I before I got into automotive, I used, I used to sell things on eBay, computers, electronics on eBay. I, in 2007, I had a Motorola Razr and an iPod Video. I know some of you guys remember this. I <laughs> sold my iPod Video and my Motorola Razr to buy a used first iPhone in 07 because I couldn't afford a new one. Mm -hmm. I got a used one off eBay, and then ever since then, I've had every single iPhone from the very first one. All the S models, everything. I went the iPhone, 3G, 3GS, 4, 4S, 5, 5S, 6, 6S, 7, I don't know if it was 7S, it was 8, 7S, I think it was or not, or 8, and then they did their whole 10 thing, 10S and 11. The pros and stuff. Yeah. Man, yeah. There's been so many gems dropped in this episode. I feel like if Mechanic One had a subscription model, I would be subscribed to it. Just putting the idea out there. Oh, that's a good idea. After this, I'm starting my own podcast, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mechanic One Podcast. Dude, you know, one of one of the clients that one of the episodes that we haven't released yet, it's on um uh Gymshark. And they actually uh, as a company released a podcast both for external and internal. Might be another idea you can take. Um just to kind of show the company culture. Because you know, one of the things you talked about, you know, your your company's uh, culture is based on you as a personality. And it's like when, when our listeners want to know how do we expand that, Gymshark's model is like, hey, let's develop this podcast to show our employees around North America. And, or, you know, because they're originally based in like UK or something. Let's start a podcast to show what our culture is like and about so that we can have a unique, uh, uh, a universal culture across the different campuses that they have. Um, pitching ideas here. We talked a lot about Apple. But have any of you guys read the autobiography of Steve Jobs? Highly I recommend wanted to. that book changed my life. That book literally changed my life single-handedly. I highly recommend reading that. Real book. quick, I wanna I wanna add one thing. Any all the books that are recommended, we will have links in the uh, show notes. Third thing, Sorry. by the way, I have to listen because this is my favorite book. It teaches you the basic, basic essence of finances. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. Czar actually recommended this book to me and I, I read it. And hey. yeah, like I, I, I remember it. it changed the way I looked at money. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And sure. they say the poorest person is not the one who who doesn't have much, you know, doesn't make much money. The poorest person is the one that has and makes the most money, but has nothing saved. Mm. So meaning, mm. again, the same thing: expenses over income, right? Money coming in should be more than the money going out. This should be applied to personal lives and to our business. And a lot of how your business runs is a reflection of you. Um, you know, I can't stress this more, who you are and what you believe in and how you do things. If you're a perfectionist and you're an OCD guy and other things, sure enough, 100%, you're going to be the same attributes are going to go on to your business. Your business is just a mirror. It's just a reflection of who you are. If it isn't, then, then I call those business hijack businesses. Then you're not... The owner has lost control of how the business is ran. Because if the owner has how the, the full authority, the full, you know, pretty much the full control of the business, the business should reflect the owner's every strength and weakness, you know. Uh, and hopefully the weaknesses can be made up by his team, right? Um, but that's one of the biggest things is, and if you we focus so much on Apple, so much people are all of our diehard Apple fans, but how many people know so much about Steve Jobs, um, you know, to an extent. And if you read the autobiography of Steve Jobs, um, there's another reason why I chose a model mechanic one as a fanboy after Apple, uh, because obviously Apple is such a huge I'm just one shop, but I'm like, if there's anything that I could model my logo, my brand, my dude's aesthetic appeal, the way we do our business, everything, um, there's no other company that even comes close than Apple. I get it. A lot of, I got a lot of hate about, oh, what, you're gonna be a computer shop? You're over a computer shop that can never work. I'm like, you don't get it, man. It's just <laughs> ideal. It's not even just aesthetic. Don't get lost in the Apple and the wrench, you know, logo, whatever, no. Those, that's just the surface. But what drives the business from underneath are the core values that was found out, you know, the beliefs, the, the foundation of the business, right? Every single person that gets hired and he gets told what do we believe, what we're about, what we offer. You know, 
And everybody needs to have 100% buy-in. Every single person, down to the person who's sweeping the floors. Because if you don't have 100% buy-in, and that's another thing, I've never had to fire out of all the people that I've hired over 50 plus in this location, or maybe another 50 plus, 25 plus. Thankfully, the turnover rate hasn't been that high. Um, out of 25, I've probably had to fire three. So that tells you, that I, that when I'm interviewing someone, I tell them straight up that our system is built in a way where if you're not the right fit, it automatically pushes you out. And I love that because as an owner, there's nothing more awkward for me than sitting <laughs> someone down and telling them, you're fired because I'm not Donald Trump. I hate being the bad guy, right? So my main thing to me is if automatically, if a person underperforming, they know it before I do because they're the weakest link. They look around and they're like, holy crap, everybody's working, everybody's doing whatever. I'm, I'm falling behind, you know? So majority of times, the system pushes them out. If they quit because they're not making enough, they're either they're, the work environment not suiting them anymore, is too fast-paced for them, is too aggressive for them, um, whatever the reasons are, you know? But the way I look at it is, I love having a great work, at, work atmosphere. I always tell everybody, we have fun. We love what we do. We have fun. We constantly making jokes all day long. We say do music ha on Saturdays. We have pizza. We you know we buy lunches here and there. We have fun while working. But what's the underlying thing? We work. We're not here to mess around. If you're not in the attitude and the and the, and the mindset to work, stay home. You know. So mm -hmm. everybody, we need to work, but we just need to work in an environment where we, as a business owner and as a team. That's what I always tell them, that we're lucky and we're so fortunate that we get to build the environment for ourselves. Whatever environment you want to work in, make that that environment. You know, make this as your second home. You know, if you want to have, bring your own microwave, you want to bring your own whatever the heck, whatever it is, people do. One guy has his own toaster, um, one guy brought his own guitar, whatever, right? Right? All the different things. One guy brought his basketball and a hoop, right? Dude, 100%. My shop is your shop, 100%. Full buy-in, you know? Because I always tell them, you guys are the most people that I spend my time with. I don't, the amount of spend, time I spend with you guys, the only other person that I spend this much time with is my wife. It's literally my wife and then you guys. So <laughs> that, that means a lot. That like, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? We spend a lot of time to, together. So if we're going to spend this much time together, like we have to be like one unit. We have to be like one body. I might be the head, you might be the arm, the other guy might be the other arm, the other leg, you know? But we have to move as one unit, you know. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of business owners don't understand that they treat their employees like employees, and you have to treat them like family. Man, uh, Chima, we're running pretty long on time. Uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, I was just gonna say one of the questions we usually ask when we're closing is uh, what your favorite brand is. But I think you just answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> so for yeah. electronics, Apple. For clothing, Under Armour, cars, for cars Porsche. Okay, cool. And then, nice. Abdumna, is there any closing thoughts that you had or anything you wanted to do to wrap it up? Uh, not really, man. Zara, you said at the beginning of the podcast that you were an open book and you definitely have been. I'm very excited for this episode or these three episodes potentially to come out. Um, and uh, thank you for, for coming on and giving us your time and knowledge and uh, wisdom. No, thank you, man. I'm, I'm still a student. So I was reflecting on the process of recording this episode, and one thing that I realized is for me, this episode was by far the easiest episode I've ever done. I told Abdul Manan before we started, hey, you're going to manage the flow of the conversation. You're going to manage the questions. You're going to make sure Zara is being challenged and engaged throughout the whole process. I'm just going to sit there, and I'm going to soak in the knowledge. And Zar obliged, right? Zar dropped gems on gems on gems. Now, looking back, what I realized is that Zar really got the short end of the stick. We recorded part one and part two on the same day. It was like four hours straight that Zar just kept talking. So Zar, if you're listening, I'm really sorry we put you through that. We didn't give you any bathroom breaks. We didn't give you any food, no water, nothing. So really appreciate you sharing your time uh, and being so generous with your, your wisdom. Now, as always, I have my key takeaways from this episode. But before we get into that, I want to share with you a clip from a bonus episode we did with Yasser Mushtaq on Dodge tying Porsche as the most admired brand. I, 
I think the industry has kind of shifted direction in terms of the whole emotional kind of uh, approach towards marketing and 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 like creating products because I think specifically in the automotive industry there was this huge focus um, in the last uh, maybe decade of stat sheet comparison like you know even if you look at old car marketing and old car branding it's all about zero to 60 times and like feet like like a hard stats and like numbers and stuff like that and once you get into that game it becomes hard to compete with like just amongst brands to like keep constantly one-upping like each other and i think mm-hmm. that, that the whole market especially from what i've noticed in the last couple of years is that they've switched into delivering products rather than stats and like performance indicators rather than being like oh our car gets this does this or like does that it's like our car has this like a like a massive engine that makes like a ton of noise like what more do you want from like our brand like you know who cares about like miles beyond who cares about like that kind of stuff If you enjoyed this episode with Zar, I am sure you will enjoy that episode. Check it out where you get your podcasts. It is episode number 20. Now, here are my key takeaways. Number one, people are willing to pay for good service. Whatever space, whatever industry you're in, you should be thinking, how can I create an experience that leaves my customer thinking, this is the greatest experience I've ever had. And number two, effective advertising is about reaching your customers where they are. There's a lot of talk online about how traditional forms of advertising like direct mail are dead. But if your target audience is consuming direct mail and they're not on Facebook, you could spend a million dollars on Facebook and not convert. And that is all for this week. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share with a friend. It really helps grow the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week.